Um, but so many times people fail to reinforce a desired behavior. So usually an undesired behavior will take its place and come in. Um, and usually that undesired behavior gets our attention, doesn't it? Yeah. So then we scold the animal. And then <clears throat> if attention is what they're looking for, we just reinforce the undesired behavior because the desired behavior didn't bring a positive reinforcer. And the animal is always the one that determines the reinforcer and the punisher or, or the aversive, never us. We, it is up to us to identify it and use them. Those are our tools that we put in our virtual treat bag. Um, Kim asks, are parrots more complex? Parrots are different. Parrots are, there's a reason I am absolutely fascinated with parrots. Tickle wickle. They're not easy. <laughs> They're definitely not easy. They've been some of my best teachers. Um, and this is why I don't learn from easy. So I try to pick complex not necessarily. This is why we have Levi the deaf dog, Snow the deaf and blind dog, Sam the blind parrot. Um, those are great educators of mine because they cause me to think outside the box. So I may be able to tell Rico good and reinforce with a pine nut. Um, I may be able to tell Rocky good and reinforce with attention proximity because he can hear me. How are you going to reinforce or how do you ask a deaf and blind dog to do something? You have to communicate differently and I do it through touch. Touch, um, a little bit of scent, but not very much. It's primarily touch. Behavior just happened. There's Quint I'm looking at Quincy. So Sharon Collins, who I don't think is on here this morning, she asked me one. She asked me one time, "Do you ever not train?" Good morning, Violet. And I was just like, "Um, yeah, when I'm sleeping." Am I ever not training? No. Like I'm sitting here, looking at your comments, looking. Hey, Deb, good to see you on here. <laughs> um. I'm sitting here paying attention to your comments and I see Quincy's head rise to the left of me. And then I turn and look, that's communication. Her head rose, her eyes are not looking at me. They're looking in my backyard. Her ears are perked. So yeah, something's getting ready to happen. I thought she was probably gonna start, start barking. Um, and besides, I want to see what she's looking at. Quincy is a guard dog. She's here doing her job, and I'm going to reinforce the hell out of that. Right? Yeah. Um, I'm very good at multitasking. Well, I've got 15 animals here, so I bet, well, 16. <laughs> My husband's birthday was the other day. Um, I have to be very good at multitasking. And in speaking about reinforcers, um, I gave this example in several different live streams, but say since we were talking about barking, uh, Quincy can reinforce. I noticed that Levi's barking has increased. So I sit back and I start watching. I was like, why is Levi barking so much? And um, I don't mind. I don't mind if there's like people at the door, but I have to be happy living in my own house too. Reinforcing behavior here. Hang on a second. Proximity. Um, so I'm paying attention to why Levi is barking so much. So I just sat in the background and I watched and Levi would run to the front door and bark. And every time he ran to the front door, he's our deaf dog, and barked, Quincy would follow. So. Levi's, the behavior of Levi barking was being reinforced with attention, not from me, from Quincy. 
And so Levi can't hear. Quincy can. What? So I was like, behavior modification plan. All right? Put a behavior modification plan in place. When Levi would bark, he couldn't hear me, but Quincy can. I would call Quincy to me. And when she would come to me, I would ask her to sit and I'd reinforce with a treat. I saw the behavior, the future rate of behavior of Levi barking starting to seriously decrease. <laughs> because I removed the reinforcer. I didn't have to tell Levi no. I didn't have to use any type of positive punisher and aversive, which uh, positive punishers are aversives. All I did was remove the reinforcer. Mm -hmm. So then pretty soon, Levi would bark, and I didn't have to call Quincy to me. Quincy would just come to me. And then what I would see is Levi would come back, peek his head around the corner, and look for where his reinforcer was. The behavior decreased because the reinforcer was no longer delivered. Yeah. So mm, positive reinforcement training is so much more than positive reinforcement. <laughs> I guess I should say applied behavior analysis is so much more than positive reinforcement, than just positive reinforcement. If you find yourself a trainer or a behavior consultant that says they use 100, nothing but 100% positive reinforcement, that just a small red flag should go up because that is not possible. <clears throat> Great. Where are you? There. See that? Okay. There you go. Oh, that's one I haven't seen in a long time. Coco's been here two years. But what he does, he goes to the top of his cage, tilts his head back, hits three rungs. Boom, boom, boom with his feet. Can you hear that? And now he's coming down. So... Um, <clears throat> Abnormal repetitive behaviors, some people call them stereotypical behaviors. They happen usually due to, hey Debbie, haven't seen you in a while. Um, they happen usually due to um, not being able to get to something. They also start to happen out of lack of an enriched environment. It goes even deeper than that. Lack of appropriate enrichment. Tim says, so my macaw will yell if I walk past the cage and go upstairs. She will continue to yell till I come back downstairs. I mean a macaw yell. I'm not reinforcing the yell. How can I stop it? Tim, that is multifaceted, but so the reinforcer is what? Your attention? What I would suggest you do, somebody's ringing their bell. What I would suggest you do, Tim, is before you have to walk up the stairs, start training another behavior that's going to be your replacement behavior, okay? In order to change an undesired behavior, you need to replace it with another, okay? Um, so I would pick a time, several times per day. My training last, I just, Trained Rocky, was reinforcing with Rocky uh, the behavior of him laughing, okay? I just had several training sessions. You see how quick that taught me? I mean, how, how short that took me? Your training sessions don't have to be long. Ten seconds, three seconds, minute and a half. It's not the length of time. It's the frequency. So train a replacement behavior. If he's reinforcing... Hey, Lou. If attention is a reinforcer, um, give it for another behavior. And it's easier. That's called differential reinforcement, where you're reinforcing one behavior by taking all others and putting them on, placing it on extinction, meaning ignoring. Um, it's also how you shape behaviors. But find a replacement behavior. Like Rocky's was, uh, he would scream. I'm talking about a cockatoo, Moluccan cockatoo scream, once every three seconds for two to three hours on end. Um, we replaced that scream with a yoo-hoo. So I started, I started um, replacing 
teach training, putting, he already knew how to say you who. So I, I reinforced that 100% of the time, then slowly placed it on an intermittent schedule reinforcement, reinforced it once in a while. But I did that, in your instance, Tim, before it was time for me to walk upstairs. I would do it with, when I was in line of sight, washing dishes or scrubbing the floor, which I never did, uh, something like that. But I gave this example, and this is a real live example of something that happened here several years ago. Um, hey Lou, I'll answer your question in just a second. Somebody brought their dog to the front of our center for a scheduled appointment. All right. Um, one of the volunteers here came running it. She went out to greet the person and came running in and said, "Oh my God, they have a shock and a prong collar on their dog. I'm." I want to tell them they have to ha take it off before they can come in. I said, I wouldn't do that. Bring them in. Because you tell them you have to take that collar off before you come in here. Yes, we know the animal can learn faster without it, but that person doesn't know. That person is doing what they, they do know how to do. And they want to do better or obviously the shock and prong isn't working or having side effects, that is why they're here. Let's positively reinforce their behavior of being here. If I were to walk out and say, you have to, you have to take that collar off, um, already that wall is gonna start going up on that person. I've just offended them. What I've done, hey Mary, is I've just told them whatever you're doing is wrong and it is not allowed here. And I'm not going to do that because I know the side effects of using aversives to control behavior. I walked out and I said, come on in. And um, I greeted him. I greeted his dog. And we started our consultation. And it started with hello. <laughs> And then he's like, I'm like, so tell me the behavior issues you're having. That's tickle, 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 tickle. And then, then I said, exactly, Kim. Um, and then I said, okay, so how is the shock and the prong collar working for you? I'm not saying take it off. I'm just saying, tell me. Tell me how it's working for you. He's like, well, okay, I've got the shock on maximum capacity, and I've been jerking on the prong collar, and it's not working. And I said, this is what I say next, all right? I always say, are you seeing this happen? This happen? This and this? And he said, yes. And I says, okay, um, that's what I learned. These are the side effects of using aversives to control behavior. And he's like, oh, my God, that's exactly what I'm seeing. And I said, let's try this. Leave this stuff on. Let's just try to do some target training and let's start to do some different things where we reinforce the dog, the dog's behavior for what we want it to do and watch how many times I say no or uh-uh or stop it. Watch how many times. And I didn't say that, um, but then all of a sudden this dog is just doing everything I'm asking it to do. And then I start changing my reinforcers, dropping the treats, using the attention, using the pace at which I move. Um, that is the key education point to the people because oftentimes when we're training dogs, we're training the people. <clears throat> okay. So, and then I was just like, you know, he might be able to move a little freer. Let's take that stuff off and see what happens. Now let's get a longer recall. All right. Now let's do it outside. And I, I needed an <clears throat> idea for Prince, our baby Toko Toucan. That's right, Rocky he has done very well, in my opinion, with target training, both solo and with his macaw siblings. Recall and foraging on his own. And I will continue the training on those. Any idea what can be a next activity that can train him to take target training to the next level? <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm actually getting ready to show a picture of it. Well, let me just do it.
Target training to the next level, Lou. How about that? Bang. Teach him to go into a crate. Teaching an animal to touch its nose to a target, your hand, a stick, whatever, is a great way to get an animal to move from point A to point B. Um, it's a great way to get an animal to go into a crate. Um, I, Lou, crate train. All right? Something else you can do, and I did this with pigs, three pigs. This is great focus and control. Okay? It doesn't matter what the animal we're talking about. Um, I took three pigs, Lola, Ruby, Zoe, all right, and this is what I would do. I'll show you a training example. I could probably do it real quick with these two. Um, this is what I would do. I would get them each to station to an area. They were not stationing on an X. They were not stationing on a carpet pad, anything like that. I would teach them to station to an area. And then I would take my target stick. So you see where I'm going. You can do this with prints in your, in your macaws. Um, I would say, Zoe, touch. Zoe would come up and touch. Go back to your station. Okay? Ruby, touch. Ruby would come up and touch. Back to your station. Lola, touch. Come up and touch. Back to your station. Okay? Um, because what's going to happen is, and be careful, Lou, and I know you're in the Parrot Project as well, so maybe we do this as an activity, okay? Because it's great. It's one where animals will focus and they want to do what you want them to do. And when you get that kind of focus, come up here. When you get that kind of focus, animals are so eager to engage. They will pass up flying or running after somebody at the door because of target training. And they know this is a focus and control exercise, and that mental simulation is the enrichment. That's right, Rock. So does that sound like a good one to start with, Lou? <laughs> yeah, we do all kinds of focus and control exercises here. For example, um, here's one that I do. See if I can do it with just attention. And we do these with the birds. Um, Let's see. Okay, let's see right here. Sit. Go back to her. Sit. Put your on camera. So don't forget the white one's deaf. Let's see, touch. Did you just fall over? <laughs> Stay. Quincy, come. Sit. And there goes my dog. <laughs> Where'd she go? And watch Coco go down. Okay. Sit. Come on. Quincy, come on. Yeah, party time. Okay. Um. So I'm target training them. Um, I'm not going to reinforce that behavior. So that's all target training, and that's a focus and control exercise. Um, so there's several things we do here. We're always training. I can't stop training. I've got 15 animals. If I stop training, things go to hell in a handbasket here real fast. <laughs> like getting excessively barking dogs. 